Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Um, my name is David Brownell, and I am the executive director of the North Olympic History Center. And I'm so excited that you've joined us today for another one of our uh, TIPO Talks, which is a presentation series in partnership with the North Olympic History Center and Jamestown Spalham Tribe. And today, we're going to be taking a virtual tour of the Jamestown Spalham Tribe's archaeological and archival collections. And as we go through those, I'll try and sort of tie some different uh, cultural and historic facts that kind of pertain to connecting those different collections together and, and why they're so important for our collective history. So, uh, like I just said, we're going to be taking a virtual tour of the Jamestown Spalham Tribal Collections. Uh, the tribe has actually been uh, uh, curating archaeological collections for over 20 years now, um, in addition to materials that have just been sort of passed down uh, through generations of the tribe and, and turned over to the tribe. And then in 2018, 2019, we actually um, built the Jamestown Tribal Archives. So uh, all of these collections are currently located in secure climate controlled uh, storage facility over in Carlsberg. Um, however, that is one of the goals of the tribe is to, um, at some point in the future, uh, create a, a dedicated curatorial facility. And one thing that I want to note is a lot of these items that we're going to be talking about today and looking at uh, will actually be on display starting next fall in the renovated Jamestown Spalham Tribal Library. So um, definitely keep, that, uh, keep an eye open for that on your calendars, um, hopefully sometime around this time next year. The library will be reopening and we're going to have some wonderful exhibits showing, uh, displaying a lot of these objects. So uh, if you want to get a closer, more personal look, please come out for that. Um, so to start, I'm going to start with the archival collections. Um, as you can see in these photos, we built up uh, for much more capacity you know, we're, we're constantly, the tribe is constantly generating new materials, constantly accepting donated materials. Um, it's important to note, and, and this is uh, one of the challenges of the tribe is uh, a lot of folks will try and bring in and donate anything that pertains to um, Native American tribes. And so uh, I want to just put in that note right now that, that the tribe, the Jamestown tribe only accepts objects that are from um, within Jamestown Spalham's ancestral area and actually pertain directly to the history and culture of the tribe. Um, when possible, the tribe will try and help direct you towards a more appropriate place for your donation. Um, but we, the, the tribe simply doesn't have the capacity to take everything that everybody wants to donate. Um, we have to be selective. Uh, but what's amazing about the Jamestown Spalham Tribal Collections is there's a lot of variety in the archives. So we've got everything from um, specific family, tribal family collections where uh, tribal family has got together a bunch of photographs, um, documents, and other materials pertaining to their family history. Uh, we collect those, we archive those, and preserve them. Then we also have archival records related to the actual tribal government itself, uh, the fight for federal recognition, which went all the way back to the early 1900s um, and was finally successful uh, and became official in 1981. You know, that, that 60, 70 year process, we have a lot of amazing documentation, you know, meeting minutes and other notes taken uh, during tribal council meetings, correspondence from Ron Allen and other tribal officials with the BIA and other agencies as the tribe was undergoing that process. Um, in order to get federally recognized, there's seven criteria that a tribe have to prove to the federal government. And I can't remember those off the top of my head, so I'm not gonna rattle them off. Uh, but it's a very onerous process and it involves the tribe producing a ton of documentation and, and the Jamestown Scalum tribe was actually one of the, uh, I guess you could say pilot projects uh, with the new system that the federal government uh, opened up in the late 1970s to allow tribes to become federally recognized. Um, Jamestown Squam tribe was one of the first four tribes to be federally recognized under that newer process in 1981. Um, we also have collections that are restricted access, so um, accessible to tribal citizens and tribal descendants, but not the general public. This includes um, tribal enrollment documents and documentation involving um, citizenship within the tribe. 
Uh, we have an archive, the black file cabinets that you see in the bottom photo is an entire archive of tribal publications. Um, I saw Betty's on this presentation. She has made some amazing tribal calendars and annual reports um, and a ton of other materials over the years that are great documentation of the tribe's growth and expansion over the last 20, 30 years. Um, we've archived all of those so that researchers and future generations in the tribe can come in and look at those firsthand. Um, we have thousands and thousands of photographs, um, both photographs from uh, individual tribal citizens, photographs from tribal programs like the youth programs, the elder programs, the annual uh, tribal picnic, all of those, you know, we, we want to collect as many of those photos as possible and preserve them um, also for future generations. And then we have, um, we do have some archaeological site records and other forms and maps, but those uh, primarily are located in our other storage unit with the archaeological collections themselves. It's, it's important to keep those materials together. Um, but also in the archives, we have, uh, we have artwork. We have um, very, very old publications going back to the 1800s. We have old maps going back to the early 1800s um, and a variety of other uh, just really cool historic materials. Um, also currently in the archives, but usually located in the tribal library is an extensive collection of rare books, um, many of which were published in the, the 1800s, or early 1900s that contain uh, very valuable information on the tribe's history. Uh, and that's what you see in the, the boxes in the smaller middle photo. Right now we have all of those rare books packed up in archival boxes and stored while the tribe's library is getting renovated and expanded. Um, some of the most fascinating archival materials, uh, at least to me personally, are the documents pertaining to the actual founding of Jamestown. Um, so in 1874, the original uh, land that became Jamestown, about 210 acres, was purchased. Um, it was purchased using uh, $500 in gold coin that was collected from the tribal communities from uh, roughly 13 different families, pulled that money together to buy the acreage. However, when that um, deed was signed, it ended up uh, the property owner at the time, whose last name was Delante, he actually, the, the deed from Delante went straight to James Balch instead of uh, breaking it out to the different tribal families. So what you see here in the images on the right are the actual uh, property deeds between James Balch and his wife, Siamitsa, and the, and the different tribal families in order for them to divvy up those lots and apportion them. So this one in pr particular uh, is a deed between uh, James Balch and Tanis John, who's descended- David, we're only seeing your first slide. We're not seeing the ones you're talking about. Oh no, uh-oh. Let me try that again. Apologies, everybody, and thank you for letting me know. Okay. Um, okay, can you guys see these now? Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. I really appreciate it. I, I can't see what you guys are seeing. So, um, so this indenture document that you see on the right side, uh, if you look closely, you can see that it's actually signed between Lord Jim Balch and his wife, Siamitsa and Tanis John and his wife, uh, and, and uh, Tanis John and his descendants are actually uh, tribal, senate, descent, tribal citizens of the Port Gamble Squalum tribe today. Um, so you can see those different family connections go far back into time, and they spread out into the different uh, modern tribal communities of Lower Elwha Squalum, Jamestown Squalum, and Port Gamble Squalum tribe. Um, just a really, really cool document. If you look at the plat map on the left side, what you can see there is how each individual lot was apportioned to each family based on how much they contributed. So the lot all the way on the far side, lot A, which had the largest acreage, about 29 and a half acres, that was owned by James Balch and his wife, Siamitsa, and then was passed down to their descendants because they contributed the largest amount of money. Um, next to their family were the Colliers, and then it kind of moved east from there. Each tribal family had a different one of these lots, and the reason why there are these long, skinny, perpendicular lots is each family required beach frontage to 
pull up their canoe and continue practicing their traditional uh, fishing and gathering and subsistence activities and swim in Dungeness Bay. So moving over to the other storage unit, um, we have a variety of things in this unit. Um, this particular shelving unit that you can see is uh, the tribe's ethnographic collections. And so that includes, uh, we've got just under a hundred baskets, hats and other objects woven out of uh, cedar bark, raffia, sweet grass, bear grass, and a variety of other materials. Um, many of those baskets are from Jamestown. Many others are not. Uh, one of the things that happened out here on the Olympic Peninsula historically was um, through the late 1800s and early 19 to mid 1900s. Um, and still to this day, there's many tribal women who weave baskets and then sell them to tourists or visitors to the Olympic Peninsula as sort of trinket baskets or uh, collector's items. And a lot of times, you know, those items will be passed down for a few generations in a family, and then that family will come back and donate it back to the tribe. Um, and unfortunately, with, with many of those smaller trinket baskets, we simply don't know who made them. We know roughly what area they would have come from or, or who they were culturally affiliated with, um, but we've sort of lost the provenance. So we have them in our collections. They're the, these amazing artistic objects. Um, functional artistic objects, but unfortunately we don't have much uh, provenance or documentation on who made them and where they came from. Uh, we also have a large number of carved wooden objects, including um, both replica paddles and full-size canoe paddles, um, canoe replicas, wooden combs. Um, we've got carved wooden objects of little uh, human figurines, um, uh, we have carved wooden tools used for weaving um, blankets on a loom. Um, so a variety of goods covering all the way back to the mid 1800s. Uh, there's a box full of fabric materials. So it's kind of funny. We've got, you know, these, these very old hats. Um, and then, you know, coming up into the modern era, we've got a box full of t-shirts from different tribal activities. But it's important to preserve those you know, so that 40 years, 50 years down the line, um, those t-shirts are really going to mean something to, say, the, the tribal youth who are in the youth program the year that that t-shirt was used, you know, to preserve that so that when they're tribal elders, we can pull that out and, and bring that memory out and bring that back to them. Um, it's going to be a really cool experience. We have a uh, rough, I, I think, four, maybe five boxes of drums and strikers. Uh, all of the drums were made by uh, Jamestown tribal citizens or descendants and then donated to the tribe um, with the exception of one drum that was gifted to the Jamestown Squalum tribe by another tribe. Um, and so it, I should note that many of these objects were donated uh, to the tribe by tribal citizens or tribal descendants. But we actually have a fair number of items that were um, gifted to the tribe from other tribes. And so, uh, you know, it's important to us to, to preserve those items, um, to preserve those connections and to preserve those partnerships and those relationships for future generations as well. Uh, finally, we have a couple boxes of just absolutely beautiful beadwork, um, necklaces, earrings. Uh, the majority of those are, are relatively modern, contemporary. However, we do have um, a beautiful beaded necklace. It's uh, Russian blue beads and shells that were actually uh, collected by Myra Niels, who was a missionary who worked with the tribe back in the 1860s, 1870s. Um, he did some collecting while he was uh, living at Skokomish and visiting the other tribes on the Olympic Peninsula. And about uh, 15, 20 years ago, the Jamestown Slalom tribe purchased a large number of objects out of his collections when they went up for auction um, because those objects were collected from uh, Squalum ancestors. So we have these beautiful dentalium and Russian blue bead necklaces and earrings, and those will be on display in the uh, tribal library exhibits next year. Uh, other beaded artwork, we have um, stone, very old stone and bone beads in our collections. Um, just really, really amazing pieces.
should we be seeing these items you're talking about? I didn't, I didn't have uh, pictures of the necklaces, unfortunately, to put in the slides. Sorry. Uh, so now moving to the archaeological collections, uh, the Jamestown tribe curates uh, large collections from roughly six or seven archaeological sites. And then there's about another um, 10 archaeological sites that we have smaller collections or uh, maybe just one or two individual items from those sites. Um, some of these collections are actually owned by the tribe. So the Squim Bypass site and Chiquing Village site, um, those archaeological collections are owned by the tribe. Um, the Indian Island collections are actually on loan to the tribe from the Navy. So because the Navy now owns Indian Island, they were the ones who excavated those sites. Um, they loan those materials to the tribe and uh, we curate them. Uh, so basically the tribe maintains intellectual control over uh, its ancestors' artifacts, its ancestors' objects, uh, but legally they still belong to the Navy. And, and the pictures in the background here, uh, just to kind of give you a, a sense of scale, the boxes, all of the dark brown bankers boxes are the Squim Bypass site boxes, and we've got um, just over 130 linear feet of um, materials from that site. And then all of the light blue and light brown boxes that you can see are from Indian Island. So we have um, almost 300 linear feet of materials from Indian Island. Um, the map on the bottom you can see is kind of giving you a rough idea of where these sites are. So the Squim Bypass sites are the two red stars uh, farthest to the west there. You can see um, there are actually two sites. One was right at the Squim Avenue and Highway 101 interchange. Uh, the other site is farther to the west, um, just west of River Road to the north of Highway 101, if you're familiar with that area. Um, the Shtequing Village site is located where Battelle Marine Science Laboratory is now uh, at the northeast corner of the head of Squim Bay. It's a significant ancient village site. And then the Indian Island sites, there's, there's actually quite a few, and we have more than what I've clustered on this map, but if I put more on the map, it was going to get a, a bit too blotchy down there. Um, but you can see basically all of the, the spits and uh, significant landforms on Indian Island had large camps or village sites. Um, during the course of the Navy occupying that space for the last, roughly the last century, um, and all of the work that they've done on Indian Island to develop NAVMAG Indian Island, um, Navy base, they've had to excavate many of these sites and remove materials. Um, and so that's how the tribe ended up with them. Uh, so to take a little bit of a closer look at the Squim Bypass site, it's an uh, absolutely fascinating archaeological collection that actually covers at least the last six to 8,000 years of history. So we've got uh, two different components at the Squim Bypass site. Uh, the older component is a late Holocene uh, hunting camp component. So uh, it's, it's dated based off of stone tools. And what that means is we don't have radiocarbon dates. We don't have um, specific scientific data that can, we can set a date on a, a calendar and say that's when the site was occupied because of those stone artifacts. However, what we can do is compare the stone artifacts found in that archaeological component with stone artifacts, lithic artifacts found at other sites that do have dates. And so um, basically comparing the technology and the cultural activities that were going on at those sites uh, we believe that that older component of the Squim Bypass is somewhere around six to 8,000 years old. Then there's a more uh, uh, recent component that we do have specific uh, uh, carbon-14 or radiocarbon dates. And those radiocarbon dates show a uh, pretty much continuous occupation starting around 24, 2700 years ago right up until 170 years before present. And it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to figure out what happened 170 years ago that stopped those traditional activities from happening that had been going on for the last three millennia. Um, the first place that non-native uh, immigrant settled was on the prairies, the, the open landscapes where they could farm. 
as soon as they start farming those prairies, it stops the natural movement of the deer and the elk in those spaces. And it also stops those traditional hunting and gathering activities that have been going on for millennia. Um, so you can see right there, uh, a, a early source of conflict between the new arrivals and, and uh, the folks who had been here for thousands of years practicing these activities. Um, the really, the tiny little shell in the middle, I just wanted to, to bring that guy into this slide because uh, it's one of my favorite little notes on this site. This site was primarily a hunting camp for elk and deer. We see that evidenced in the, um, the tools that they were using both to hunt the elk and deer and to process them. And I'll talk about more of that in a second. Um, the remains themselves of hundreds of elk and deer at this site. But what's interesting is there's still a component of shellfish. Uh, and if you know anything about the Sklalem people today, they love their shellfish. And so it always tickles me that we've got this campsite where we have these thousands of bones from deer and elk, but then we also have these little lenses of cockle and clam shells. It's only an hour and a half walk down to the Shtukwing village site from this camp. So it totally makes sense that, you know, if you're up camping on the prairie for a couple weeks and you had a hankering for shellfish, you'd walk down to the beach, pack your basket full of clams and walk back up and have a nice little seafood feast up in the middle of the Squim Prairie. The uh, mortar and pestle that you see in the top right side of this image, uh, it's hard to get a sense of scale from this photo, but it's actually massive. Um, the, the mortar itself, the large rock in the bottom, it actually weighs probably about 80 or 90 pounds. It's roughly a foot and a half across in each direction. And this would have been used for processing uh, plant foods. It would have been used to process acorns, hazelnuts, um, uh, any one of dozens of plant foods out here. Uh, you would grind those up using your mortal and pestle. Uh, also bracken fern root was another important source of um, starch rich carbohydrates. You can pull up those uh, the bracken fern roots and pound them out into a type of flour that was then baked into a, a flat cake. Uh, so just an absolutely magnificent uh, example of uh, these types of tools. On the top left image is a ground slate projectile point or knife. And I say or because without it being hafted, um, we don't know exactly what this tool would have been used for because ground slate, uh, we have some in our collection uh, that's actually hafted to a small wooden, a U wood handle that's maybe six inches long, and that would have been used as a knife. They also would have hafted these on darts and spears. One of the really great things about ground slate points compared to, say, a flaked lithic uh, projectile point like what you see right below it, these ground slate points, they have these long, smooth blades that are very thin. And that's important when you're hunting things like elk and deer and even seal and sea lions. Uh, one of the most important parts of that animal um, that you want to save uh, is the hide itself, the skin of the animal. Um, and, and having a hide that you can sew that's watertight was incredibly important, not just for clothing, but for um, buoys, for uh, sealing and whaling and fishing. Um, Any one of dozens use uh, bladders for holding water and other liquids. What you need is a animal skin that doesn't have a big ragged hole in the side of it from where you threw a spear into it. So if you use these ground slate projectile points, what that does is leave a very small incision in the hide of the animal, maybe an inch across and less than a quarter inch wide, but that it goes very deep. It still penetrates deep. It still takes down the prey, um, but it leaves the hide intact for, uh, for uh, further uses. Um, just below that is a flaked point um, the, this is a projectile point, specifically an arrowhead. We know that because of how small it is, um, or it could have been a dart point. Uh, and this is a great example of what's called an Olcott type uh, lithic projectile point. And these are found at sites going back. Olcott sites are um, seen as um, contemporary and in some ways culturally um, analogous or overlapping with what's now called the Clovis culture. So if you think back uh, about 15,000 years ago, right, right before, right around the end of the last ice age, 
Um, most of the peoples on this continent were living in very small groups and they were uh, moving across the landscape at a high rate around the year, pursuing large terrestrial mammals like the Manus mastodon, bison antiquus. We had caribou here on the Olympic Peninsula. The Roosevelt elk has been here quite literally forever since the last, end of the last ice age. Um, all of those animals were being hunted by people moving over the landscape. And these were the type of points that they were using. And you can see compared to some of the points that you meet, flaked points that you may see in other collections in other parts of this country, it's, it's not exactly the most symmetric, um, some would maybe say aesthetically pleasing point. And that's because of the material that they're working with, which is called dacite. Um, dacite is a local, it's a basaltic stone that actually was brought here uh, from the glaciers in the last ice age from Mount Garibaldi up in British Columbia is, is the closest source. So uh, that day site was picked up by the glacier, pushed all the way south onto the Olympic Peninsula 14,000 years ago. That, that ice sheet melted and all of those day site cobbles dropped down and many of them were filtered down into our river systems. So even today, if you're a geologist or somebody who knows what to look for, or back in the day, a, a traditional tool specialist in the tribe, you would be able to walk out into a gravel bar in the Dungeness River, and you still can today, and find these nice day site cobbles just laying around. Um, so it's important to note the Squim Bypass site is actually located on a terrace overlooking uh, the, Bell, the Bell Creek Riparian Channel, 6,000 years ago, that was the Dungeness River's channel. So it's a, it's a paleo channel of the Dungeness River. There's your toolbox right there in front of your campsite. When you run out of projectile points or you need to start making more, you can walk out to the gravel bar, find the right type of stone, bring it back to the campsite. And so what we find at the Squim Bypass site is not just these nice flaked projectile points in their finished form, but we have thousands upon thousands of pieces of what's called lithic debitage, which are all of the tiny stone flakes that fall off while they were sitting there for thousands of years and making these stone tools. We also have cores. So when you take that uh, cobble and you smash it, you get what are called blanks. Basically the pieces that come off, that's a blank, which you can then flint nap out into a nice flaked uh, projectile point or a napped blade for cutting, a chopper, that sort of thing. And those blanks, you would have actually put one or two of those in your cedar pouch or your uh, elk skin pouch. And hunters would have taken those out into the, the mountains with them when they went hunting because a hunting expedition wasn't just a, a daily thing. You would go out for an extended period of time. And it was important to have that toolkit on hand so that if your projectile point broke when you're out in the mountains, you had a backup right there in your pouch that you can nap out and then continue hunting instead of having to walk all the way back to the village or back to the river to try and find um, new stone types. Located just be beneath that image in the bottom left corner, you can see the Lincoln penny just to give you a sense of scale. This is called a quartz microblade. Uh, and these are absolutely fascinating little objects. Uh, here in the Olympic Mountains, we have veins of quartz that run through the mountains and they produce uh, different qualities and types of, of quartz. They're sort of a, a milkier white quartz that you'll see with lots of veins running through it. And that's not super useful for making tools, but you'll also, and I, I myself have found while just walking around the Dungeness River at times, beautiful, beautiful, clear quartz crystals, like something you would find in a gym shop. These are incredibly useful when you don't have access to metal for sharp razor blades. What you would do is take one of those quartz crystals and smash it, and it creates a thousand of these little tiny micro blades. And believe it or not, they would take this little blade that's about three quarters of an inch to an inch long, and this would have been hafted to a piece of cedar. Um, if it, the, the piece of cedar was small enough, actually sort of reminiscent of like chopsticks today so in, in size and scale, and hafted onto a piece of cedar about that big using um, some elk sinew or deer sinew thread. 
and that would have been your fish fillet knife. And they've actually done exper uh, experiments. There is an archaeological site excavated out at the mouth of the Hoko River on the west uh, northwest corner of the Olympic Peninsula, uh, right in that uh, sort of cultural overlap area or transitional area between the, the Sklalem and the Macaw, there's what's called the Hoko wet site. And what was great about that archeological site was um, it's actually been inundated. So it's, it's, it's been underwater, it's, it's boggy soil, and it's preserved a bunch of the organic materials that would have rotted away if that site had dried out. And what they actually found were these hafted microblades. So, they did some experience, experiments, they recreated these microblades to figure out what, what utility they have. And what they found was that these quartz, hafted quartz microblades are incredibly great fillet knives, especially for flatfish, but also salmon and, and whatever kind of fish you're catching. Um, and that we do find there, were, uh, there was fish bone collected at the Squim Bypass site. And so again, going back a couple thousand years when that was the Dungeness River Paleo Channel, there would have been a really nice salmon run in the Paleo Channel at that time. You know, today Bell Creek only gets a few salmon up it every year, but at that time there would have been thousands of salmon swimming up what's now Bell Creek, and they absolutely, the, the Sklalem ancestors would have caught those and flayed them right there at the site. So again, showing these, these different tools and, and the different resources that they were used um, to tap into that it wasn't just hunting and it wasn't just fishing and it wasn't just shellfish. It was all of these together um, created this amazing diet and this amazingly productive natural system um, that the Sklalem managed successfully for millennia. Um, finally, the image on the bottom right side of your screen is a, a scraper or a chopper. And uh, you can see that that is a very different type of stone and so that's a great example of while they would work with the day site um, because that was what was most available locally, whenever possible, Squalum ancestors would trade to other tribes in other areas for the types of stone that they had. Um, so this, this image in the bottom right uh, side of your screen is a type of chert that would have probably come from uh, Eastern or Southeast Washington. Um, we also have a large number of nephrite adz blades in our collection. Nephrite jade is only found in a vein that runs north-south through the Cascade Mountains. And that would have been traded for with the Skagit, Swinomish, um, other tribes over on the other side of the, the Strait and other side of Puget Sound at the base of the Cascade Mountains. Um, so a little bit about Shtukwing village site. Again, this was the village located at the mouth of Squim Bay. Uh, you can see a sketch of the village in the uh, top right side of your screen. So um, one of the really cool things about this village site is we have documentation from tribal ancestors in the 1920s um, sharing their memories of what this village was like, what life was like in this village with uh, anthropologist Erna Gunther. And they actually told us who lived in each of these homes. And so just real quick, going from left to right, um, if you look at this sketch of the village, that tiny house on the very far left side of the village, according to the informants, um, was, as, was abandoned as far back as they could remember. The house, the second house from the left, was the house of the Dick family. Their descendants are the Dick mm -hmm. family of the Jamestown Squalum tribe today. The house mm -hmm. just to the right of that is the home of the Wood family. Their descendants are tribal citizens of the Jamestown Squalum tribe today. And the reason I wanted to note this is, uh, with the exception of the nipple mall, the big hand hammer that you see um, over towards the left center of the screen, all of these other artifacts were collected from a trench that was dug right through where those two longhouses were located. So we don't know exactly who these items belong to, but we have a fairly good idea that it belonged to one of these two families. And it's just really cool today to be able to take the tribe out there. So we actually have now an agreement with uh, Battelle and with the Department of Energy who manages uh, that property now so that the tribe has access rights both for traditional plant gathering activities and just to take um, the, the tribal elders and tribal youth groups out to that site 
and walk down that beach and talk about where these different homes were and to be able to point that out and then to be able to actually come back and look at these items in the tribe's collections that came directly out of those homes. Um, and, and what's interesting from a scientific perspective about this site is the, the archeological objects that were uncovered during these excavations show a huge strong and a very strong link between this village and the Squim Prairie itself. So this village is located on this small shingle beach on the entrance to Squim Bay. Great access to fishing and shellfish resources, great access to waterfowl resources. Um, the, the name of the village it's, itself, Shikwing in Sklalem means a good place to hunt and a good, or a good place to shoot. Um, and that could be tied to two things or probably both. Out on the spits in front of the village site were uh, the takum or the duck nets. And each family in each of these longhouses owned a pair of poles, duck poles, that they were responsible for maintaining. And every year when our annual waterfowl migration comes in in the late fall, early winter, they would go out with these absolutely massive nets that were made out of nettle twine. And they would pull those up between the poles and somebody would go out in a canoe and scare the waterfowl off of the water and the ducks fly into the net. You drop the net and you have hundreds of ducks ready to uh, preserve for winter storage for food storage. So Shtukwing, a good place to hunt, could come from those incredibly productive duck pools. The name Shtukwing could also come from the very obvious link that we see between this village and the Squim Bypass site in the Squim Prairie, and that we have hundreds of pieces of elk bone and deer bone um, showing not just the butchering of those deer and elk for their meat and their hides, but as you can see in the images around this screen, also for their antlers and their bones for tool usage, which was incredibly important at the time. Uh, elk antler and deer antler is much denser than bone. Um, and so it's a, it's a better tool material when you're making something like an elk antler wedge, uh, which would be if you look uh, on the right side of your screen, third image down, you can see the, uh, it, the right end of that uh, elk antler tine has been smoothed down and ground down using a piece of sandstone. And what you would do is you would take that elk antler wedge and you could put that pointy end down on your, uh, your cedar plank and then using the nipple maul, which is the large green stone um, hand hammer, two images to the left, you would hammer, hammer that elk antler down into the wood um, one of the reasons why cedar was so incredibly important for the Coast Salish peoples is it split straight down the grain. So using an elk antler wedge and this hand hammer, you can split nice straight planks for your longhouse. You can carve out a nice beautiful canoe. Um, you can do all of this incredible woodworking. Um, and it's easier to do that using uh, antler tools. You can see right on top of the elk antler wedge is actually the base core that one of those elk antler tines would have been hacked off of. And you can kind of see a little bit of evidence of burning. So part of that process in creating an elk antler wedge is you put the tine in the fire, burn where you want to cut, then you chop through it with a stone tool, then you put it back in the fire, take it back out, chop it again. And so it's a very laborious process of creating these tools. Um, the, along the row at the very bottom, you can see a series of um, the two on the left are toggling harpoon points. And then on the, the bottom right image is actually just a, a bone point. These would have been hafted onto uh, harpoons or darts and used for hunting uh, anything from waterfowl to sea mammals to flatfish. Uh, we even have a documented account of one poor whale making a bad right turn into the Washington Harbor Lagoon, and everybody in the village jumped up and grabbed their spears and went out and they caught that whale, and that produced food for the village for over a month. So, you know, anything that sort of came within their sphere was, was opportunistically harvested. Uh, the uh, really cool image that I love in this slide, the, the, the picture that sticks out with the black background 
is an etched pebble that we found uh, during excavations at the site in 2019. Uh, the Department of Energy staged a, a series of excavations. Basically, we wanted to um, delineate the site. So the excavations that the majority of these artifacts came from back in, in 1981 were salvage excavations, um, trying to save materials that had been dug out of that trench that I mentioned previously. Uh, so what happened was they collected all of these amazing artifacts and all of the data that they possibly could, but all they really knew was about the extent of the site was where that trench itself was and, and a few other small tests. So what we did was three years ago, we went out and actually dug shovel tests over the entire Battelle property and delineated this archaeological site. And it's not surprisingly, it's absolutely massive. Um, we've got components where uh, the physical village was itself. Then we have components out on the spit that are related to more um, seasonal encampments. Uh, then also the, the actual uh, processing of elk and deer itself was done out on spits. You can imagine elk are extremely large animals. And so when you bring that back to the village site, dragging a, a 2,000 pound elk into the middle of the village and chopping it up there and leaving a huge stinky pile of offal and, and blood and all of this other stuff, it's not really ideal. So what you would do is go ahead and process that elk out on the spit where the seagulls and the eagles and all of those other uh, wonderful creatures are gonna come up and clean it up for you. Um, and that's what we find evidence of out on the spit. What we also found out on Buggy Spit, which is the small spit extending north from the Battelle campus, was this beautiful small etched pebble, um, which shows a direct cultural affiliation and, and connection to the Chewitzen village site over in Port Angeles, which makes sense. They're both Squalum village sites. Um, however, as far as I know, this is the first etched pebble that we found at um, one of the ancestral village sites around the, the Squim area. So, just a really, really cool find there. Uh, the lithic artifact that you see uh, just on top of that is a stone chopper. And that's what you would have used to say, hack these um, antler tines to uh, uh, chop. So what they would do is once you harvested the, the meat and the hide off of an elk, they would actually then use a chopper like this to harvest the actual ligaments and tendons from the bones on the elk and the deer. And those ligaments and tendons were what was used as thread um, to uh, tie to both haft tools and blades onto tools, but also to sew wounds, um, to sew clothing, um, any one of a, a million different uses. So uh, it's just really cool to see how every single part of the animal was used. Nothing went to waste. And then just a, a few notes on some of the other archaeological collections we have. Um, the uh, artifacts on the left side of your screen are from a site on Squim Bay, and I'm not going to mention where specifically, kind of gives a little bit too specific of information, but um, basically these were excavated about uh, 15, 20 years ago, and uh, you have this beautiful small mortar and pestle, which actually, and it's hard to see in this picture, has a red residue. Um, probably from ochre, and this was probably used for grinding ochre to make the red face paint that was used for red to menuas, um ceremonies. Uh, so when you look at, and there, there's only, there's very few authentic paintings of um, Squalum communities and Squalum activities that exist today that were done by contemporary artists. But when you look at those images in almost all of them, uh, the squalum in those photos have the red, or not photos, the paintings have a uh, red Temenuas face paint on. And that was uh, done using ochre that was sourced um, from a place down on Hood Canal. So they would go down there every year, um, gather a bunch of this red ochre, and then bring it back to the village and use it throughout the year. Um, just below that, you can see these wonderful little um, perfectly round stone balls that um, I confess I have absolutely no idea what they were used for, um, but one thing that's interesting, and unfortunately you can't see it in this picture, 
the smallest stone ball there all the way on the right side of the photo, uh, picture has what we believe to be a small human face sort of pecked into it or carved into it. It looks like a little, a little smiley face pecked into this stone ball. Um, the one just to the left of that, you can see in this image, it has these um, etched lines in this round ball. It's almost, it looks reminiscent of the stitching on a baseball. Um, again, not sure why somebody did that, but it obviously took them hours and hours and hours to produce this object. Um, and then I, I mentioned Indian Island a little bit more, but I uh, had to had to include one image showing these wonderful collection of five gallon buckets full of marine shell that we curate. Uh, it just um, tickles me to no end that we have these buckets full of butter clam shell, but we preserve those in the hopes or in the 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 knowledge that as time passes, we're constantly developing new technologies that can tell us more about the past and tell us more about what the environment was like, what life was like for tribal peoples, um, how the Sklalem ancestors interacted with their landscape, how they managed their landscape. You know, there's a lot of technology that we use today, like radiocarbon dating, that somebody 80 years ago, 100 years ago, would never have been able to conceive. So, with that in mind, holding on to these buckets of clam shells, even though there's very many of them, and I sometimes felt like maybe we shouldn't have so many buckets of clam shells, it's important to do that because we don't know what technologies we'll have, um, what scientific methods we'll have to extract data 40 years, 50 years, 60 years from now, um, that will be important for science and be important for the tribe. Um, and an example of that, and the reason I bring this up is a couple years ago, we uh, excavated a site at the Tribal Veterans Memorial. And at that site, found a, a ton of Olympia oyster shell, which is a shellfish that a uh, marine bivalve that you really don't see represented in very many archaeological collections around the Salish Sea. So A, it, it's, it was just important in that regard that we preserve that oyster shell. But then we've taken it a degree further and we've worked with researchers from the University of Washington who have taken some of that Olympia oyster shell um, from an archeological context that we radiocarbon dated, it's at least 970 to 1100 years old. So a thousand years before um, non-natives arrived and, and these huge changes were implemented on our landscape comparing the Olympia oyster shell from a thousand years ago to Olympia oyster shell from today. And that actually has helped scientists get a better understanding of ocean acidification, how that's affecting shellfish in our corner of the world and how it might impact them in the future um, as the ocean continues to acidify. Um, so that's just one little example of, um, there's just an immense amount of scientific data that's stored in each of these little shells. And so the reason we hold on to them and the reason why the tribe uh, curates these collections, even though on a surface value, it looks like just a bunch of shells is that someday, even if not today, that shell will have very significant scientific and cultural value to the tribe. So, I will jump off that soapbox. Uh, please join us again in December. So uh, we won't have a presentation in November. Our series date fell on a, a national holiday. So we're gonna skip November. We'll be back December 9th for a look at the archeological excavations at the Jamestown Tribal Veterans Memorial that I was literally just speaking about. And I'll dive a little bit more into that Olympia oyster shell, um, what we learned about the Olympia oyster and other shellfish in Squim Bay. Um, so please come back and join us for that presentation. Uh, for those interested in learning more about this and other topics, I strongly encourage you to check out the Jamestown Tribal Library website at library.jamestowntribe.org. Um, you can also check out the House of Seven Generations Online Museum at tribalmuseum.jamestowntribe.org. And then finally, we're actually, all of these presentations are being recorded. And uh, Brandon, who works in the Jamestown Tribal Library, has done an amazing job of converting these and uploading them as YouTube videos. So 
if you get on YouTube and search for JST Library or Jamestown Spallum Tribe Library, uh, you'll see they uh, have a YouTube channel now. Get on that YouTube channel. We've got dozens of presentations. Um, and we also have shorter videos. If you don't want to listen to me drone on for a full hour, we've got some shorter uh, videos there that go on for just, you know, five to 10 minutes. And uh, so I uh, strongly encourage you to check that out. Um, and then my personal spiel, uh, if you're interested in more of this programming, you want to support uh, more of these programs, uh, please consider becoming a member of the North Olympic History Center. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, and our mission is to connect the future through the present with the past through doing programs like these with um, local tribes, other organizations, um, and just building a better awareness and understanding and appreciation of this amazing history that we have here on the Olympic Peninsula. All right, well, I think that does it for us today. Thank you all so much for your time today. Uh, I enjoyed this and I hope to see you all again in December. <laughs>